Hey everyone, welcome to episode three of Let's Talk Fluid Art, the cozy holiday show dedicated to all things acrylic pouring. I'm Anna Blunt, thank you so much for joining me today. If you didn't see last week's episode, you can find it here. So here's the rundown of today's episode. Coming in just a few minutes is an interview with Jody Flynn from the YouTube channel, The Painted Dreamer. It's always great to hear other artists' perspectives and I think you'll enjoy it. Today's giveaway is a big set of mica powders. Keep watching all the way to the end of the video to see how to enter. I'll also be sharing some of my best tips for acrylic pouring and answering some of your questions. But first, it's time to play Ghosts of Paintings Past. If you don't know how this game works, you can watch episode one or two where I explain it a little bit more, but for now, let's bring in the ghosts. Ah! Ah! This is a much smaller ghost than uh, normal, but uh, we got a jar of ghosts here, so let's pick one. Woo! Where did it go? Okay. We've got our ghost here. Let's see what it is. Ooh, Christmas ornaments. This is a good one for this time of year. So this is a video where I used all materials that I got at Walmart. I got some glass ornament balls. I got some apple barrel pouring medium and some apple barrel paint. So it's all inexpensive materials. And I show you in this video how I mix up the paint and then pour it into the inside of Christmas ornaments to make this really interesting kind of layered look. And then the nice thing about pouring on the inside of Christmas ornaments is that you don't have to put any kind of varnish on the outside because it's already glass coated. So if you haven't seen that video yet, you can check it out here. Just in time for doing a quick Christmas craft. So that's it. Another ghost of a past paint pour has been brought back to life. Coming up next, I get to talk to Jody Flynn, also known as the Painted Dreamer. We're going to talk about how she got started in acrylic pouring, her inspiration, and the mindset behind her channel. I think you'll really enjoy it. Don't go anywhere, because it's coming up next. So I'm here with Jody of the Painted Dreamer. Jody, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks sure, for talking. Sure, It's great to talk to you. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about yourself. I am a born and raised Chicago girl. I lived here all my life, and uh, I did a little stint in uh, South Florida. Uh, loved it there, but I ended up coming back here. I live here uh, in a little town called Eldon outside of uh, Chicago, and I live here with my partner. He's... Uh, well, he's working downstairs right now. And ooh, what else about me? I uh, I feel like I've lived many lives. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I started uh, I started doing fluid art. Um, twenty nineteen, April of twenty nineteen is when I actually put paint to canvas. I feel like all of us who start fluid art, there's some moment where you're like, ah, I can do that. Yeah. So what was that moment for you? I had that aha moment because I've, I've always been kind of creative and, and doing, you know, crafts or art or whatever. And I've always wanted to do paint, but I, my drawing skills are lacking and I don't have any formal painting uh, training. So I, my aha moment was uh, a girlfriend of mine was doing uh, acrylic pouring at uh, about the end of 2018. And she was posting her stuff on online. And I'm like, what is that? what are you doing? Cause you're doing something with paint and I may be able to do that. And she told me this acrylic pouring, you know, there's so many videos on YouTube, Google it, do all that. So I did, you know, and I, so I started with, uh, you know, flip cup, straight pours, you know, kind of simpler things like that. But my big influences I'd have to say were, uh, Karen waterfall acrylics for flip cups, um, Gina DeLuca, Rick Cheadle, Julie Cutts. I kind of, I, I probably watched all of their videos. Um, <laughs> but that was my aha moment when I realized, okay, I, I was like a sponge taking in all the information. And I was like, 
I can do this. And this I can actually paint now. <laughs> I know. It's awesome. I, I've sort of been realizing about myself. I'm more of a, a color and flow, like balance and movement and that kind of thing. Not mm -hmm. like, I can't just whip up a sketch. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't just paint effortlessly. So for mm -hmm. me, it was that similar fluid art. Oh, I can manipulate this. This works yes. to my, you know, it plays with my strengths. Yes. So what made you decide to start a YouTube channel then? You know, it was actually on the fly. Okay. <laughs> I am probably one of the most introverted people I know. <laughs> and my boyfriend always says, you know, two years ago, if somebody would have told you you were doing a YouTube channel, you would probably have laughed at them. I'm like, you're right. I, I would have. But, you know, with the pandemic, um, I was uh, I was working for United Airlines as an IT analyst. So okay. completely different. But I was doing this as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was basically given a, a do-over, right? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's see if I can do something with it with this fluid art and you know and that's when I started getting into the blooms and doing uh the blooms um so I didn't start my channel until July of 2020 okay uh but I, I you know started the blooms um when it came out and I you know th there was a lot of struggle with it at first and I was struggling and I thought you know what let's do this let's let's just kind of document what I'm doing in my journey and I you know I just even said it I think in the description I'm here to document my journey and hopefully it will help you as well <laughs> so that's basically how it came about and I uh, it took me it took me a while to get used to uh filming just even myself with my own camera it's, <laughs> it's, still, tough. it's, it's un, it can be unnerving <laughs> It does get easier over time, but I remember, and I still get, you know, triggered sometimes, like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> and I'm like, just paint and have fun, Jody. it's okay. Yeah. But really, it was kind of spontaneous, and I was just like, All right, we're, you know, we're going to do this, but we're we're going to make a process, and we're going to see if, you know, if I help, if I, if I help one person, I, I will be happy, and I've been able to help. That's <laughs> so cool. That's cool. I feel pretty good about that. So how fast did your YouTube channel start to grow? Like, was it pretty, pretty slow for a while and then it started to gain traction or was it kind of like a straight line? It, it was slow at first, you know, but I thought, you know what? Everybody starts at zero. There is no use, some a magic number that somebody starts at. We all start at zero. And I was like, I'm just going to, do this for myself and, and and if nothing else I'll have a document of you know everything I've done and it was slow for you know probably the first mm, through the holidays but then you know into the next year something happened I posted a video and it kind of went viral you know, and usually it's something like that. You're not even paying attention to it. And it's like, wait, what just happened? And then uh -huh. more people wanted to view it and I'm getting more subscribers. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> yes. so this is new. You're filming yourself on your phone, in your room, and then you're just, up, you're uploading it. So like the dynamics, it's not like you're you know, in front of a whole film crew. It's just you you're, and yourself. Right. And then you're just putting it out there and and for it to travel along and do its thing, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> it is cool. So your, uh, your videos often focus on blooms, mm -hmm. floating blooms, transfer swipes, things like that. So yeah. what, what drew you to that particular technique? When I first saw, and this was before the blooms, uh, the, the online course even came out, uh, you know, I started seeing a girl just posting all these radical things that uh, that later we all know now know as Bloom's technique but you know I'm, I'm a sucker for lightning and spider webs and all that and that's what it reminded me of and I was like how is she doing that and I, I was like I have to know how to do that <laughs> you know I'm, I'm doing pretty well with my flip cups and my straight fours but I really have to know how to do that and it just snowballed from there you know as soon as as, as uh, she, she came out and said she was going to do an online course I was like sign me up I have to do this and yeah it just snowballed from there I I'm still completely in love with this technique that I it's not that I don't want to try others it's like okay what else do I have for this one still you mm. know it, 
It's like, I have such a long list. I don't know if I'll get through it in this lifetime. <laughs> wow. So what goes into each new video for you? Like, what's the inspiration? Is it just like looking at your stash of paints and going, I want to put these colors together or I want to, you know, cause you do a lot of floating blooms and they all yeah. follow the same basic pattern. So what is keeping it fresh for you there? I have to love doing it. If I don't love doing it, I, it's, it's just not going to be there, <laughs> you know, in yeah. the, in the piece. So I kind of spend my time going, doing floating blooms, transfer, uh, transfer blooms, swipes. I love doing palette knife swipes. Um, uh, sometimes it could just be something that completely pops in my head and, I, and I'll write it down. I have, a, I have lists upon lists upon lists of ideas or, you know, sometimes subscribers will say, hey, I, I'd love to see this color or maybe try, you know, this technique. Like with my floating blooms, for example, I'll do a swipe in the background, right? Mm -hmm. And I had an idea from a subscriber, hey, what if you did it on the diagonal? And I'm like, what if I did it on the diagonal? So sometimes it's as simple as that. And mm -hmm. other times I'm watching TV and I see a color and I'm like, ooh, that's a great color. <laughs> ooh. And then a color palette starts forming in my head and I have to quickly write it down. And it, I mean, it really could be anything. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So with your YouTube channel, um, what sort of benefits, obviously it's kind of like a diary. That's what you started it to be like, let's just kind of document what's happening, but what have been the benefits of that over the last couple years? Uh, with the diary, that's the, uh, to me, that's a great benefit because I sometimes refer back and say, what did I do there when I want to, you know, do a piece for someone, you know, outside, you know, just in my studio. Um, but I think other benefits is you're helping more people than you think, even if you're just, you know, posting your video, even if two people see it, if you're helping those people, even if it's just providing entertainment or, you know, they've never seen it before, um, making new friends, the, the whole art community here is, it's just amazing. I mean, I have met the nicest people ever. It's, it's fantastic. So, those, I mean, those are some of the benefits. I mean, they're, they're, I wasn't going to really talk about financial, but you, you know, there is that aspect too, if that's what you're looking to do, but it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's, it's not, not easy. easy. And I've learned that it's not about your subscriber count. It's about your views. So, yes. um, and it fluctuates, it ebbs and flows too, you know, like certain times of the year it's up here and other times of the year it's down here and it just, you just go with it. And just, as long as you don't rely on, it being, you know, like, oh, I need it as an income, it, you know, that come at it as, you know what, this, this is just sharing knowledge and being part of a community. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my biggest benefit, I think, is sharing knowledge. Like yeah. That. What about YouTube is hardest for you? You know, do you struggle to keep it fresh to like, get a video up every week? Yeah, I don't know what sort of mindset you have behind your channel, but what's the hardest thing for you to maintain? You know, when I started early and, and in my previous life, I owned a couple of processes. So it was like I was very process oriented. So I kind of look, I kind of came into making YouTube videos the same way. Okay, I'm going to set days I'm going to do it on. Okay, this day I have to start editing. So it's kind of like I, I, you know, I know when I have to do things and when I have to get it done and upload it and have it all ready and all that good stuff. But sometimes it's like, okay, it doesn't it doesn't plan out that way for me. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. I have to get this starting to edit, but oh, wait, no, I have a dentist appointment or I have to do this or I have to do that. So that's really the challenge for me is logistics more than creativity because I, I feel like I always have something I want to show. <laughs> yeah. It's more the logistics and, and trying to actually get it edited and up there for everybody having uh -huh. the time to do that. For sure. So do you have any tips for somebody that's just starting fluid art? Maybe not doing YouTube, just practicing it for themselves. What would yeah. you say? Yeah, so write everything down, document it. You know, even if you're going to video it for yourself. Um, but when I first started, I had a notebook. And each piece I did, I wrote down every single detail, you know, the, the colors, the brands how much you used, what your pouring medium was, um, what, how it was mixed, you know, if you use silicone, how many drops, you know, everything. And then, you know, step by step, because if you do something right, you have a document. If you do something wrong, 
then you have something, okay, well, I tried that, that didn't work. Let's, let's tweak this a little bit. So it, it document, documenting it and don't be hard on yourself. It, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating at first because especially if you're so new to paints and, and, and consistencies really hung me up, um, getting, getting it thick enough. Uh, sometimes a lot of times it was too thin for me and, and just have fun with it above all have fun no matter what is happening because that's that's what it's there for you know and, and your only competition is yourself how far you've come mm -hmm. don't look what anybody else is doing I I, I had to learn that lesson myself <laughs> but it, it is it is so true just just you know your competition is yourself yep and that's it so do you have any tips for somebody who's wanting to start a YouTube art channel be consistent uh, you know, no matter how good or bad your channel is doing, you know, as, as you're first starting and as you're starting to flourish a little bit, be consistent with it. Keep going. Even when you want to give up, just keep going with it. You know, if it's something you really want to do, you know, if you, if you find you don't have the time for it, maybe, you know, things come in. But if this is something you really want to do, just just keep going with it. Don't stop. It's going to be hard. Some days you're going to want to say, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. This is stupid. I, you know, nobody wants to watch my channel or, you know, I've been there. I still do that sometimes, you know, keep, keep going. We all know mixed media girl, mm -hmm. Marcy. She has a channel called, uh, the, the business of art. Yep. Yes. That helped me too. Mm. It, it was really an eye opener. And, you know, I, I, I don't know that I watched every video, but it really helped. And, and I think she even said, you know, be consistent, be consistent with, you know, your videos, be consistent on all your platforms, you know, maybe start with one. And then if you're able to move up to two. Yeah. Yeah. Good tips. Well, thanks so much, Jody, for joining us. I had a lot you're of fun welcome. talking to you. I had a lot of fun talking to you as well. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and uh, yeah, see you later. <laughs> what am I saying? Goodbye. That's yeah. it. Eek. Eek. Cut. Cut. <laughs> well, that wasn't exactly how I had envisioned the interview finishing. I had a couple of technical issues, and I didn't have sound for the last couple minutes. But don't you just love getting to know other fluid artists better? It was great to hear Jody's perspective on art and YouTube, and if you haven't already checked out her channel, go do that now. It's The Painted Dreamer. Okay, coming up next, I get to share some of my best tips on acrylic pouring as well as answering some of the questions that I've gotten from you. So let's talk fluid art. So it's surprisingly hard to take three plus years of fluid art experience and kind of boil it all down into a few nuggets of wisdom, but I think I've got some good ones for you today. Number one, get yourself a digital kitchen scale. This is going to make your painting so much easier to stay consistent in your mixtures and then just getting your ratios right. It makes a world of difference, takes a lot less time to mix, and they're really inexpensive on Amazon. They're like 10 or $15, so it isn't a big investment. Number two, calculate how much paint approximately that you'll need before you start a project. So when I was first starting, somebody shared this ratio, I forget who it was, that you need about one ounce of paint for 16 square inches of canvas. That's about a four by four block. So if you've got, for example, a 16 by 20 inch canvas, you do 16 by 20 and then you divide by 16, which happens to be 20. So you'd need about 20 ounces of paint for a 16 by 20 inch canvas. So that is good for uh, really anything where you're gonna be tilting to stretch the paint. So flip cups, ring pours, straight pours, things like that. As you tilt, the paint runs unevenly and so you need plenty of paint. If you're doing like one where you spin it from the middle, you might not need quite as much. If you're doing a Dutch pour or a micro swipe or something like that where you're starting with a background color and you're just adding other things in, you don't need quite as much. But kind of as a baseline, you say, how big is my canvas? Multiply the length times the width, 
divide by 16, and that'll give you an approximate number of ounces of paint that you'll need total between all your colors. It never hurts to have a little bit extra, but that way you're not gonna be making so much too much or not enough, and then you end up and you go, oh no, that flip cup doesn't cover the canvas. So calculate how much paint you will need before you start painting. Number three, make sure you get your canvas prepared properly before you do a pour. So you might wanna tape off the back edges of your canvas to keep the undersides and the, the back edges neat. Um, I also like to put thumbtacks in, in my uh, canvases to hold them up off of the table surface. So do that and just make sure that your canvas is perfectly level. And then also, if the canvas surface is loose or kind of saggy at all, spray it with some water or even just wipe some water along the back of the canvas and that will tighten it up. Now your canvas is prepared and ready to go and shouldn't give you issues like, uh-oh, it's, you know, everything's running off the side because I don't have it level or everything's running into the middle because it's too loose. So prepare it properly and you'll have a better result at the end. Number four, Focus on one or two paint recipes at a time. And by recipes, I mean mixtures. For example, paint and Floetrol, paint and water, paint and glue, etc. Those are your paint recipes, your paint mixtures. Focus on only one or two of those at a time. For me, about three quarters of my paintings are mixed with Floetrol, that's my pouring medium. And then the next most common for me would be paint and water. And then I also do sort of blooms and glue and things like that on the side, but it's not nearly as often. If you, if you focus on one or two mixtures, it's a lot easier to keep that information in your mind and be like, oh yeah, I know that this is the right consistency for this mixture. I know that this um, technique will work with this mixture. If you're always bouncing around between different mixtures, Unless you're really careful to write everything down, ratios and thickness and everything, it, you're, it's just gonna leave you confused and you won't be able to learn from your mistakes. Number five, don't be ashamed of inexpensive materials. This is not an inexpensive art form. It uses a lot of paint, it uses a lot of canvases, and if you're watching people on YouTube and they're always using like the expensive paint and the big gallery wrapped canvases and they're making big paintings and all of this, you're going to blow through your money really fast, unless you're rich. I'm not. <laughs> I have enough to paint. I'm comfortable now. But certainly when I started out, it was like, buy the cheapest paint that I can, buy the bulk packs of canvases. There's nothing wrong with that. You can still create really beautiful art. And uh, most of these paintings behind me, these are inexpensive canvases. They still look great hanging on the wall. Like at Walmart, apple barrel paint. That's fine. That's totally fine. Sargent, Blacrylic from, from dickblick.com. You know, that's like a student craft paint. It still works fine when you use it with Floetrol. So I do. It saves money. Now there are times certainly when you need the tube paint, for example, with paint and water. But even so, you can find less expensive tube paints than like Amsterdam and Golden and, you know, the really expensive paints. You can find ones that are less expensive and still work. So I like Blick Studio Acrylics. I like Master's Touch Acrylics. You can get that at Hobby Lobby when it's on sale and then it's really affordable. Uh, I love Creative Inspirations paint. They, that, that's from Jerry's Artorama and it's really, it's great quality paint and it's very inexpensive. It's like $2 for a four ounce tube. So you can find it. Don't be ashamed of not using the fancy canvases, the brand name paint, whatever. If you're making good art, that's fine. Number six, try out a few different brands of white paint. So white paint is actually kind of hard to work with in certain things. For example, apple barrel white paint will often crack if it, if it isn't mixed with enough Floetrol. I find that if I use like one part paint to two parts Floetrol, it never cracks for me, but if it's like one to one, it does. It makes these big cracks as it dries, and that's no fun. Um, also, white paint, sometimes if you're layering your paint in a cup, the white paint will sink because it is denser, heavier than other paints. So. If you're wanting to do a stacked cup and you want the white, then maybe you want house paint. 
white house paint is something that I've found is a lot easier to stack in your cup with the other colors and it doesn't sink as much. So get a few different brands, mix them together, that's fine. I like Apple Barrel and Sargent white craft paint. That's what I use for a lot of my backgrounds. And those two together, I find that it stacks pretty well and it doesn't crack. So, oh, and it's cheap. So if white paint is giving you trouble, try a few different brands, try house paint and uh, go from there. Number seven, be you when you paint. Be you if you make videos. I think we watch so many people on YouTube and we're like, oh, I wanna be like her, I wanna be like them, I wanna do paintings like that. And it's not wrong to try to imitate somebody else's work in order to learn a technique. But if you as your YouTube personality or if you as a painter are like, I have to produce what they're making or I have to try to mirror that person, it's going to take away what makes you special. So make the paintings that you enjoy. Even if other people look at them and go, that is a hot mess. If you love it, great. Don't worry about what they think. If you're making YouTube videos, you can drive yourself nuts trying to find the exact thing that other people want to watch. Make what you enjoy and show that you enjoy it and people will catch on. And now it's time for me to answer some of the questions that I've gotten from you guys. The first question was, how do you get lacing or cells? So lacing and cells, they're kind of two different things. Lacing is where it's like a spider web of one color over some other colors. Cells are like multicolored, they pop up like in a flip cup and you never quite know which colors you're gonna get. So for me, if I want cells, I put silicone oil into my mixture. I use spot on treadmill silicone, about one drop per ounce of mixed paint. And that's what I use if I want lots of cells. So micro swipe, I do silicone. If I'm doing a flip cup and I want lots of cells, silicone. If I want lacing, which is that beautiful kind of spider webby look, that's when you need something called a cell activator. A cell activator is something from the Shelley Art Bloom technique. Usually it's Amsterdam titanium white paint mixed with Australian Floetrol. Now there are less expensive ways of doing a cell activator. I like Amsterdam white paint with water, just mixed with water until it's thin enough to flow and spread, and that gives some nice lacing over colors, either in a bloom recipe or just regular kind of thick mixed Floetrol mixed paint. So that's more lacing. So depending on the look I want, it changes whether I use silicone or whether I use a cell activator. The second question was pretty similar. It was kind of, what is a cell activator and is it the same thing as silicone? Because a lot of times in a craft store, you'll see something and it's like cell power silicone oil or something like that. Or it's like cells fluid or, you know, it, it has a name where it's like, this makes cells. Cell activator is different. Cell activator does not contain an oil. The oil, you know, as it sort of bubbles up, as it doesn't mix with the water, as it rises through the paint, that is what creates the silicone cells. A cell activator, it uses the science, it uses paint density to create that spider webby lightning lacing look. So no, they are not the same. If you're looking for cells, the easiest way to do it is with silicone. If you're looking for that lacing, you need a cell activator. So then Nathan from the YouTube channel, The Fine Art of Distraction, he asked, what is my least favorite color to work with and why? And is it because you dislike the color or is it because you get bad results with that color? So that was a really interesting question, Nathan. Had to think about that for a little bit. I would say probably the colors that I least enjoy working with because I don't care for the colors as much would be like bright red and orange. I just, those aren't, those aren't my colors. I'm sort of blues, greens, black. So, um, like I like red for Christmas and stuff and I like sort of maroon and crimson, but a bright red, that's not, I don't use that a lot. Same with orange, it's like, mm. My sister Sylvie, her birthday's tomorrow actually, and her favorite color is orange, but sorry Sylvie, orange is not my favorite. 
Um, in terms of a specific paint color that is hard to work with, I will say one that I've had consistently bad results with, and I think it's my fault, is um, Payne's Gray from Blick Studio Acrylics. It seems like every time I try it, it always sinks down and gets hidden behind the other colors. I think it must be a denser paint. It's either I mix it with too much water or it's too dense and, and it gets swallowed, but it seems like even though I love it as a color, it never shows in my paintings. So that probably means that I need to try it more and beat it. But right now, I'll just use black if I want a dark color. <laughs> Carolyn Brew asks, if you don't have a YouTube channel that helps you market your paintings, how do you sell them? And this is a really good question. And also in her question, she said she was fine in the spring and summer when she was going to farmer's markets, but now that it's cold and the farmer's markets are closed, she has nowhere to sell them. And I was going to say, yes, farmer's markets are a great thing because when you're online, something like Etsy, you are a very, very small fish in a very big pond of artwork. When you're in person at a farmer's market or something like that, you become a much larger fish, fish in your community because you are the one that people are seeing. You're, they're not seeing everybody else's, they're seeing yours. So you may just kind of have to save up some paintings and then go back to the farmer's markets in the spring. That may be your best option or you may be able to find some other local stores, coffee shops, restaurants, maybe a nursing home or a hospital or something like that where you can say, can I place some paintings with you and have a price tag? People might buy them there. Um, it, is, it is a really tough question because it is so easy to make lots of art and it's really hard to sell lots of art. I wish I could give you better help there. I think you're trying the right thing with farmer's markets and stuff like that. I'd say just keep going, keep looking for local places to plug in, post to your friends, you know, share, share with your friends, try to find some festivals or craft shows. I think in-person things are gonna be your best bet. Brenda Roberts asked, how do you set up to film your paintings? And I thought that is such a good question. It actually deserves its own segment. So next week, I'm going to be showing you my painting setup, the tools and the processes and the setups that I use while I paint, while I film the paintings, and what I use to edit my videos. So if that's something that you are interested in or wondering about, come back next week. So that's it for today. Of course, you can always continue to ask questions and I will answer them as best as I'm able. They might make it into a future episode. Who knows? Anna, back to you. Well, I hope you found that helpful, and it's not too late to ask questions. Feel free to comment below on this video with anything that you'd like me to answer. And now what you have all been waiting for, the giveaway. Once again, my lovely assistant Kate is here to show us the goodies. Kate, come on out and show us what we're giving away today. Ooh. This is a 36 pack of mica powders, also from Let's Resin. So this is similar to the other ones, except this is a much bigger pack. Look at this. Ooh. So we've got all these little bottles and these are all metallic pigments. So there's, oh yeah. This is spring green. It's a nice minty kind of a color. So there's all kinds of colors. That's chestnut. So these are all metallics. These, you can use them for essentially making your own metallic paints for acrylic pouring. You can use them for resin if you want, but they're not just for resin. So if you've never used mica powders in acrylic pouring, I've got a couple videos that show you how to mix them in depending on the types of painting. So you can find those right here. Kate, thanks so much. So here's how to enter. Every comment left on this video is a vote. Feel free to leave lots and lots of comments to earn extra votes, that's totally fine. Once this video reaches a thousand views, I'll go through the comments and randomly select one to be the winner, and then I'll notify you by replying to your YouTube comment. 
Unfortunately, I can only ship this to US residents, so if the winner that I pick is not eligible, I'll go ahead and select another winner. But international viewers, next week's giveaway is one that you can enter, so be sure to come back next week to find out what it is. But that's it! Share this video with your friends, because the faster it hits a thousand views, the faster you could win. Thanks everyone for joining me for episode 3 of Let's Talk Fluid Art. I hope you'll come back next Thursday for a new special guest and another exciting giveaway. The premiere is at 9 a.m. Eastern Time if you'd like to hop on and watch and join the live chat, or of course you can watch whenever is convenient for you. I hope you have the happiest of holiday seasons, and I'll see you next week. Bye!